Momentum. We are going to look at its use in gradient descent. We know that gradient descent is the main feature of going down some surface to find the best solution, the best weights and biases for our neural network configuration. Our basic gradient descent iteration is shown here. You can see it in the center of the slide. The, you have the change in the weights is equal to minus eta times the gradient of the loss function, the gradient taken with respect to w, and of course we have a similar expression for the biases. They're not included here. We write out explicitly what you see is w of t plus 1 minus w of t is equal to stuff involving w of t. Now t here is often used in papers rather than k and k plus 1 because it's thought of like time. It's actually the iteration number. And uh, what we've done is we've unrolled the weight vector w. Normally between layers it's a matrix. For all the matrices, we unroll it as one gigantic long vector, and you'll have a big giant matrix of Ws as a vector. And now we take the gradient in that multi-dimensional space with respect to W. What are the gradient problems? And the, remember that the gradient acts on a surface. So, we could have elliptical contours, and the problem with elliptical contours is that the normal to the ellipse is not the same as the position vector to the ellipse. So in some cases, for very squashed ellipses, the gradient can be perpendicular to the direction of steepest descent from where we are to the minimum. The loss function surface could have very quick changes in its curvature direction. The loss function could be totally flat. That means we're not going anywhere. The loss function has a saddle point. Saddle point is where the surface in one direction looks like this, and then the other direction slopes up and comes, slopes down and comes up. And so this can all cause problems with gradient descent. One of the classic problems in gradient descent is the long narrow valley problem or a ravine. Now, a ravine is where, or a valley, is where two sides of a very steep hill come together to form a valley. And the problem with gradient descent in the valley is that if your starting point is right at the bottom of the valley where the rivers are, you'll go straight down the valley. But if you're up here, you'll go like this and slide up to one side of the valley and this and this and this, and you'll have this oscillation back and forth. What we're going to show in the next few slides is by adding momentum, and the momentum term is this term here. I've kind of overwritten it, but you can see it below using a different parameter. It's the change in the weights from the previous iteration step. So if you're going somewhere, you'll keep going depending on the weight, and then you'll add a gradient term as well. So that's the basic idea. Normally, we work with this form here. So beta, the momentum parameter, is set to 0.9. And we'll see in the next few slides, by analogy, that adding this term here smooths out these oscillations for the valley problem. Now, how do we see that happening? Well, we adopt a physics analogy. And in the middle here, you can see this equation, this first term. That's excel mass times acceleration. The second term added to it, nu times the, if you like, the velocity, and w is the sought 
thought to be coordinates. And then here we have a driving force. Now, what is the driving force? It's the gradient of a conservative field. In this equation, we can see, for example, that if you L was the potential energy, so it's like a potential energy function of a point mass in a gravitational field, then when you raise the mass a height z above z equals zero, or z is the third coordinate, and take the gradient as shown below, what do you get? Minus mg, the attractive force pulling down on the mass. So now we have a beautiful Newtonian analog to momentum. But wait a minute, I don't see the iterations and numbers and all that stuff we had from the previous slide. So what we are going to do is we're going to put the equation in finite difference form. That means all the time derivatives will be differences of the weights at the different iteration times. You can see here that we have uh, t plus delta t minus 2w of t, which I've written as minus w of t minus w of t. And of course, it's divided by delta t squared. Now we simply rearrange this and solve for, as you see in the second line here, the um, difference. And that's our delta w update. Now look, we have a term here that modifies the force term. And just by comparison, we'll get exactly the same formula as the momentum formula if you identify previously epsilon with 1 minus beta eta, and beta is identified with m. Now, let's think about this. As the viscosity goes up, then beta is going to get really, really, really tiny. The viscosity is lower. It's going to get larger. So there's a relationship between beta and nu. So normally, we take beta to be close to 1. That means not too much viscosity, enough to damp. And then the correction is going to be small. In other words, what we're doing in neural nets is we're going to usually pick beta to be almost 1, it means we're going to carry forward with our movement, and we're going to have some damping to eliminate the oscillations, especially for the valley problem. And here's a summary slide that of what I said. The main results are that momentum solves to an extent the deep valley problem. It's going to speed up convergence because it reduces the number of oscillations due to the viscosity, hyperparameter beta, hyperparameter referring to a tuning parameter, is usually picked to be 0.9. Different weights converge at different rates. That's another, a little graphic, a little poem. Weights, rates. Different weights converge at different rates. That's something very important to remember. Finally, momentum's the wrong term to use. It should be called, you guessed it, friction or viscosity.